You are listening to True Crime Twins, a true crime podcast hosted by Chloe and Melina Cantor. True Crime Twins is distributed by Glassbox Media and is part of the Crawlspace Media family. Welcome back to True Crime Twins, a true crime podcast where we use our occupational knowledge in criminology and medicine to tell you crime stories. I'm Chloe. And I'm Melina. Thank you so much for listening to another episode. Today, we are discussing the murder of Anna Mariah Wilson, a 25-year-old Kirby, Vermont native who was shot to death at her friend's apartment in Austin, Texas. Mariah, known to friends as Mo, was an extremely accomplished cyclist, especially in the field of gravel cycling. She came from a very athletic family. She was the daughter of Eric and Karen Wilson. Eric was a former World Cup ski racer, and Mariah grew up skiing in Vermont. Her brother is Matthew Wilson. Mo was in Austin for a race. She was staying with her friend, Caitlin Cash, who had picked Mariah up from the airport on May 10th, 2022. The race was to be held that coming weekend in Hico, Texas. On May 11th, Mariah told Caitlin that she was going to meet up with her old friend named Colin to go swimming. Colin picked her up on his BMW motorbike at approximately 5.30 p.m. They swam at a public pool in Austin and then met at an outdoor restaurant called Pool Burger, where they had dinner and then he dropped her off at approximately 8.35 p.m. Caitlin's apartment had an electronic lock which had a unique code that she had recently changed. She gave the code to Mariah and told her not to share it with anybody. This lock system provided a forensic trail for investigators to follow as to the comings and goings of Mariah in the home. At 8.36 p.m., one minute after Colin dropped off Mariah, the unique code given to her was used to unlock the door to Caitlin's residence. A neighbor whose home was attached to Caitlin's home later told authorities that he heard someone running down the stairs in between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. Surveillance footage shows that Colin did not go inside with Mo and that he drove off alone in his motorcycle shortly after dropping her off. And he then pulled over nearby to send a text to another Caitlin, his girlfriend, Caitlin Armstrong, basically lying about what he had been doing that evening. Caitlin Armstrong is a 34-year-old yoga teacher, originally from Michigan, who had been dating Colin on and off for approximately three years, and they lived together. They apparently had separated for a week or two in October 2021, and that is when Colin met and briefly dated Mo. He had later reunited with Caitlin, and then Mo had seen them both at a cycling event in January, and Mo had later sent Colin a text saying, hey, so I would like to talk to you at some point. I had originally texted you on Friday, but it appears my texts aren't going through again. This weekend was strange for me, and I just want to know what's going on. If you just want to be friends, seems to be the case, then that's cool. But I'd like to talk about it because honestly, my mind has been going in circles and I don't know what to think. The next day, Colin replied, hey, Mo. I feel very shitty for putting you in a position where you don't feel comfortable. Caitlin came along to go to a meeting about the Sprinter Spartan Hotel project. In hindsight, this was not a good idea. For some context, the reason why her texts weren't going through to Colin's phone is because Caitlin, the girlfriend, had been running interference. She was aware that the two of them had a brief rendezvous and was doing everything in her power to prevent subsequent correspondence. She had gone into Colin's phone and blocked Mariah's number, which led Colin to subsequently create a new contact under a different name for Mariah to hide it from Caitlin. And whenever he would text Mariah, he would delete the messages so Caitlin couldn't find them. 
Caitlin also took it upon herself to call Mariah personally to tell her to stay away from Colin Strickland. What's really unfortunate here is that it seems like Colin was lying to both of them, saying to Caitlin, I'm not seeing her, and saying to Mo, I'm not seeing Caitlin. Like, she's just crazy or whatever. So when she gets calls from her, she probably is just thinking, oh, this girl's just not over him or whatever. Because why wouldn't she think that if she's being fed a bunch of BS? And somebody also anonymously reported a friend of Caitlin's at around the same time in January that she had discovered that they were seeing each other again and that she was shaking in anger and said that she wanted to kill Mo. And coincidentally, Colin had recently purchased the both of them each their own gun. As you said, Melina, there was surveillance footage outside of Caitlin Cash's apartment where Mariah was staying, which was able to effectively rule out Colin of having direct involvement in this case because it showed him driving away. And then approximately 20 minutes later, another camera caught him about eight miles away from Cash's residence. This effectively ruled him out. The footage did capture a black Jeep Cherokee with a bike rack on its hitch stopping next to Cash's residence one minute after that unique code was used to unlock the door, presumably by Mariah. At the time, law enforcement didn't know who that car belonged to, but when they went to Colin Strickland's residence, they saw it in the driveway, and Colin confirmed that the only driver of that vehicle was Caitlin Armstrong. So this Caitlin must have been watching them pretty closely. I don't know that it was a coincidence that she showed up to the house where Mo was staying a minute after she got there. It wasn't a coincidence. There is an app that cyclers use to track their routes, and Mo and Colin both used it. And it had turned out that Caitlin was tracking their whereabouts probably for the entire evening. And that same ring doorbell that was pointing towards the driveway that caught Caitlin's car driving past right when Mo came home caught Caitlin the day before riding her bike past that location too. So I think that she was doing her own surveillance and was keeping a close eye on that situation unbeknownst to both of them. That's a whole other level of obsession, don't you think? It definitely shows the breakdown of trust between Caitlin and her boyfriend Colin there was no direct communication or confrontation, at least that we can see digitally, between Caitlin and Colin confronting him about his whereabouts. He said in that text message after he had dropped Mariah off that night on May 11th that he had delivered flowers to a different friend and then suggested dinner plans for that night. And obviously he had had dinner with Mariah, but he had given a completely false account of what he had been doing that night and Caitlin didn't challenge it. When he came home, she wasn't there based on his interview with law enforcement and what he told them. She came home later at around 930 that night and, according to Colin, did not confess to killing Mo, did not confront him about his whereabouts that night. She just came home and acted like everything was normal. So the fact that she was doing this while aware of the betrayal and keeping a close eye on it is just eerie she convinced herself that it wasn't Colin that was the problem, that it was Mo, even though it's obviously the opposite. On May 17th, six days after the murder, Caitlin Armstrong's Sig Sauer was test fired using laboratory ammunition, and that was compared microscopically to the shell casings located next to the body of Mariah Wilson, and it was confirmed that the potential that it was the same firearm as the murder weapon was significant. Mariah had been shot multiple times and was found covered in blood in her bathroom about an hour and a half after the crime took place by Caitlin, who had attempted CPR. Two minutes later, she contacted law enforcement, who pronounced her dead shortly thereafter. I think that the police interview of Colin was so telling, seemed to speak about Mo with this sort of awe and admiration saying that she was probably the best female cyclist in the country, maybe the world. And he referred to Caitlin as a quote participant in these races who slowed him down and held him back. And basically he was saying that he didn't like to train with her because she wasn't 
up to his level. So clearly he saw himself and Mo as at a different standard, but I don't really see the need to string them both along. And I also don't really see the need for Caitlin to have lashed out in this way because when she's stalking them on her phone, tracking their every move, and then as soon as he leaves the other woman's house, he texts her saying that his phone died, makes up a plan, acting like everything's fine. Isn't that the moment where you're like, I'm done with you? It seemed that all of the blame in Caitlin Armstrong's mind was to be placed on Mariah. It seemed like in her mind, she could save the relationship as long as Mariah was out of the picture. And she had tried to do so using a number of measures like blocking her number on Colin's phone by calling her and threatening her personally. And when that didn't work, she just decided to completely eliminate her presence altogether. When Armstrong was brought into the police station for an interview, they were able to hold her for a little while because she had an outstanding warrant for theft of services that had happened a few years prior. She had gotten Botox at a medical spa, and when she went to pay, her credit card was maxed out and not accepted by the vendor. She then said that she had another form of payment in her car. She went out and just simply drove away, stealing over $600 in services. So Armstrong was not free to leave. They were interviewing her and took that opportunity to ask her about the murder of Mariah Wilson. When they confronted Caitlin about how Colin was, quote, talking to this girl and how he went out with Mariah that night, Caitlin turned her head and rolled her eyes in an angry manner. Then she said, quote, I didn't have any idea that he saw or even went out with this girl as of recently. When she was confronted with the fact that her car was caught on video surveillance at the time of the crime, she had no explanation. The detective suggested, quote, maybe you were upset and just in the area. And she nodded in agreement. There was a clerical error with the warrant for the theft of services arrest, and Caitlin was then free to leave. As soon as that option was made available, she did so. She left. She shortly thereafter deleted all of her social media accounts and then went missing. Before leaving Texas, Caitlin sold her Jeep Cherokee for about 12 grand, which was under market value. And then she flew up to the New York area and visited her sister. She soon flew out of New York with a passport that did not belong to her, let's say. And she was on the run up until recently. Yes, marshals were unwilling to confirm whose passport she used. All they were willing to say was that it is a valid passport that she used. It wasn't, say, a fake or fraudulent passport. It was a valid passport, just fraudulently used. And they said that it was someone who looked very similarly to her. So they're kind of just stopping short of confirming that it belonged to her sister. No charges have been brought against her sister, Christine Armstrong. But while Caitlin was still on the lam, marshals advised the public that she might be using the name Christine Armstrong. They said once she was spotted by video surveillance in Newark Airport in New Jersey, which is very close to the New York line, that the trail ended there, that she did not board a flight using her own name. And that's where the trail ended for a month and a half. And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks for listening to our sponsors. Now back to the show. In mid-June, the media released an altered photo of Caitlyn with a different hairstyle. It was like a shoulder-length, dark brown hairstyle and sunglasses. And when I saw that, I was kind of just like, wow, like they really have no idea where she is. Like they're kind of getting a little bit desperate. But to my surprise... In the next day or two, June 29th, it was announced that Caitlin was arrested in Costa Rica and she kind of had that hairstyle. That's right. Caitlin Armstrong, after 43 days on the run, was found having been staying at a treehouse hostel at Santa Teresa, which is a beach community known for yoga and surfing. 
She had been staying there. It's $50 a night. She had sold her Jeep Cherokee for upwards of $12,000 at a local dealership shortly before and was apparently living off of the money. Right before she got arrested, she was actually asking a fellow hostel dweller about cheaper ways to get around because she was seemingly starting to run short on money or at least starting to get concerned about that. Well, she spent a few grand on a nose job. That's right. In a locker, they found her passport, someone else's passport, which is all the marshals were willing to say. But this man who claims to have witnessed her arrest says that it was indeed her sister's passport. And her sister has darker hair. So some people think that maybe she dyed her hair darker to try to look more like her sister. There was also a receipt for plastic surgery that was about $6,500. For a while, when she was first at the hostel, she had a bandage on her nose and bruising under her eyes, which is consistent with a nose job. And in her booking photo, her nose did look markedly different from the pictures that were released by the media. The tip of her nose was protruding in a way that was not present before. It was like tipped up, sort of. She spent much of her time down there trying to establish herself in the yoga community. She was attending classes, according to Marshalls, was trying to learn a new kind of yoga and was persistently asking staff for work at that studio They were reluctant, but eventually relented and let her fill in for instructors when they weren't able to work on their typical schedule. And she had also picked up some shifts at the front desk. So it seems that her plan was to start over in Santa Teresa as a yoga teacher and start making money and live happily ever after down there under her false identity, which was Ari is how she asked to be called, A-R-I. So I guess that dream is officially over. She has been extradited back to the States and she is in jail in Texas. Do you think Colin's going to testify at her trial? It would be pretty shocking if he wasn't subpoenaed. Colin had told the media that he was terrified that he was going to be the next victim. And honestly, I think that's a reasonable fear if Caitlin was on some kind of rampage to take out everybody that she perceived wronged her, I would be afraid too. And honestly, he's really the only person that betrayed her. You know, Mariah had no allegiance to Caitlin. And it can be reasonably assumed that Mariah was being lied to just like Caitlin was. But it's all too common that people blame the other person, the other aggrieved party rather than look at the person that's actually betraying you, the one that actually is supposed to be loyal to you, which is your significant partner. Instead, all of the blame was placed on this young 25-year-old woman who probably wasn't even aware of the extent of the situation. I highly doubt it. I bet this Colin dude was sort of seeing Mariah as like this breath of fresh air that doesn't know that much about him. She just sees him as this impressive guy who's sponsored by Red Bull and drives a motorcycle and blah, blah, blah. But I guess he liked that, but he wasn't willing to give up the stability and the familiarity that Caitlin brought him. Caitlin was extradited back to the United States and is now being held in an Austin, Texas jail. Melina and I both talked about how we were both under the impression that Costa Rica did not have an extradition treaty with the United States, which is apparently not true. But we do wonder if Caitlin maybe was under that same impression, which is why she chose that location. She has been charged with first degree murder and for the theft of service charge and is being held on a bail of over three and a half million dollars. If she's convicted, she faces up to 99 years in prison. Is she not eligible for the death penalty? I haven't seen anything reported specifically about the death penalty, but I don't think it's necessarily too late for a prosecutor to seek it. According to the Texas Penal Code, there are a couple of aggravating circumstances which make a first-degree murder considered a capital offense, which would make it eligible for the death penalty. If Caitlin had murdered a 
peace officer, like a law enforcement officer or a firefighter, that would qualify if it was an act of felony murder, such as one where it was in the commission of committing kidnapping, burglary, robbery, sexual assault, arson, retaliation, or terroristic threat. And home invasion, isn't that technically like criminal trespass? Isn't that technically burglary? Yeah, it's possible that she cornered her at the front entrance and brandished the firearm and forced them both inside. It's possible that she was hiding and prevented her from closing the door behind her or that she just walked into the house that was unlocked right after she did. Other qualifications for a capital offense is if the person is 10 years old or younger, if they're involved in judiciary service, if more than one person is murdered, if the murder occurs while the parties are incarcerated, if the murder is committed by an escapee, or if it's a murder for hire. So maybe if they consider the unlawful entry into the residence a burglary, then perhaps it could be considered a capital offense. Caitlin also stole Mariah's bike and then hid it under some thick bamboo on the property. Why do you think she did that? In my opinion, it seemed like she was trying to conceal the motive behind the crime. She was probably hoping that law enforcement would see that her bicycle was missing and think that someone killed her for the bike, but they found it pretty close to the crime scene. I think that it's really good that Mo had told her friend that she was seeing somebody named Colin because basically when her friend revealed that to the cops, everything else fell into place because Colin had such a public profile. You could Google his name and basically learn everything about him. And that's what made it so the police very quickly narrowed down the suspect. So always tell your friends what you're doing, where you're going and with who. By all accounts, it seemed that Caitlin extinguished a very bright light. Everybody had wonderful things to say about Mariah, starting from when she was just a young girl. Colin himself said that she was possibly the best cyclist in the world. She was set to go to Kenya to race. She really had a passion for the cycling community. She loved cooking for people. She had dreams of even starting a business where cyclists could come together as a community at an eatery where she put together the menu. She was passionate about cycling and she was passionate about cooking as well. To be an athlete of such high caliber, you know that she was incredibly perseverant and incredibly determined. And that's how her mother described her. She said she was determined. I knew she could do it. And we did our best to help her. And she was just relentless in her goals, but didn't seem to have the ego that so many pro world-class athletes have. She had some setbacks. She had two ACL surgeries, but didn't let that stop her. She just said, this will make me stronger. And it did. She was absolutely incredible and was going to only get better. She was so beautiful. And people don't really talk about the fact that she went to Dartmouth. She was basically the whole package. And it's an absolute tragedy that she was lost because of such a petty feeling called jealousy. Speaking from a psychological standpoint, jealousy is a stimuli that invokes the most irrational and hateful reactions from people. Jealousy makes people turn into the very worst version of themselves. And it really does come down to that sense of irrationality. Not only was Mariah seen as a threat to Caitlin's romantic life, but she was probably jealous of her in other ways because of her unbelievable athletic success. And that irrational jealousy, that hatred was too much for her to handle to the point that she just wanted her existence to be entirely eliminated rational mind would have seen that her boyfriend was a player and an asshole and possibly personality disordered to be treating two women, unsuspecting women like this. But instead, all of that hurt and that rage, that jealousy was channeled onto Mariah. In the end, I think that he's responsible. Criminally, the only person responsible here is Caitlin. And 
you should note too that what she's being accused of is not second degree murder it's first degree murder which requires premeditation planning and at least a certain extent of level headedness to be able to execute a crime like that and to attempt to cover it up after the fact i have no doubt that caitlin was not thinking rationally that she was inordinately angry but it was not second degree murder because that's someone who's acting on immediate provocation immediate impulse there is no opportunity for premeditation caitlin was angry but this was a premeditated crime we know that caitlin is a scorpio but that's not why she is prone to criminal behavior despite what some people might think about scorpios just looking at it from a criminological perspective there was probably something else at play with her psyche to make it so she was predisposed. Everybody else in this world gets jealous. We've all had people we've been jealous of. Most of us have been cheated on. Most of us have had some sort of romantic rivalry or competition, but we don't all corner someone in a bathroom and shoot them multiple times and leave them. So what is it about Caitlin that made it so she was capable of something like this? I think a part of it was that she was with somebody who was lying and being emotionally abusive at the very least. Oh, certainly. This was not without provocation by her boyfriend, Colin. This was someone who was heavily provoked and was probably being provoked and gaslit for an extended period of time, which would make anyone feel unhinged. But to the point of murdering an innocent party, I think that she might have had some sort of issue with anger management, perhaps some sort of personality disorder, for instance, borderline personality disorder. One of the most consistent features of it is an extreme reaction to perceived abandonment and betrayal. And this is not the diagnosis of all killers, but there are many examples of people who have untreated borderline personality disorder who have been heavily provoked and end up having this very drastic reaction, whether it's assault or even in extreme cases, murder. I don't think that it is out of the realm of possibility that she was afflicted with a personality disorder which would make her sense of betrayal and her reaction to that betrayal more intense than that of the average person in the general population. I get a somewhat narcissistic vibe because maybe it wasn't just the jealousy of, oh, she's younger. Oh, she's prettier. Not saying that she's prettier. Maybe that's what she thought. But maybe it's like, how dare he think that she's better than me? Nobody's better than me. And they have a fragile ego. People think that people who are narcissists think they're better than everybody else, no matter what. A big part of that is that they need other people to feel that way also. That's definitely a possibility too. I think there's some sort of personality disorder at play here and an untreated one at that. I don't want any of our listeners who have borderline personality disorder or any other personality disorder to feel personally attacked by this conversation because that's absolutely not what our intention is. These disorders, when they're properly treated and addressed, can be totally manageable and people can lead a healthy and fulfilling life. We're talking about here untreated and very extreme cases. This is outliers. This is fringe. It doesn't automatically make somebody a villain either. It just... People have traits and sometimes they have a mixture of traits and it can be very toxic depending on the circumstances. Another trait that interacted with all of this is immaturity. And that's just my personal opinion. This is a 34-year-old woman who is blaming a 25-year-old for her boyfriend's misbehavior. Obviously, that is not an evolved perspective to have. Any mature rationally thinking person would realize that they are not in the right relationship for them, cut their losses and move on. This is not someone who's mature. When I was in my late teens and I was stuck in a relationship with this man who was constantly cheating on me and always had an excuse and I would always forgive him. 
where was I going with that? Oh, I was immature. So I believed him when he made excuses. I believed him when he lied. So I think that a lot of people probably would have thought, why was she with somebody and why would she stay with somebody who would do these things? But I guess an easy answer is that I was young and I didn't know any better. I'd like to think that she knew better and that maybe she just, she didn't really care. She just wanted the idea of this guy and she was willing to do basically anything to obtain this goal. Like she probably wanted to marry him and have kids, whatever. We've all made mistakes like this, especially when we're under the thumb of an emotionally manipulative shitbag who will do anything to gaslight you so that they can look out for number one, which is themselves. In a lot of these cases, it means two timing two unsuspecting people. It's happened to you. It's happened to me. And people like that are slimy little snakes who can creep back into your life make you question everything. Gaslighting is real. It is horrible and it's effective. And I don't want to downplay that. And I don't want to take away from the significance of such an act because you and I, Melina, have both been subjected to it and we both know how powerful it can be. That being said, I never, ever would kill someone because of it. Mariah's family has set up a GoFundMe page as they are forming a foundation to help fund community organizations that help youth find confidence, joy, and strength through skiing, biking, and other activities that Mariah Wilson was passionate about. We will put the link to that fundraiser in the bio. This case is not yet closed, although an arrest has been made and someone is in custody for this crime. If you have any information about the murder of Mariah Wilson that could help authorities convict, please contact the Austin Police Department. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of True Crime Twins. If you enjoy our show and look forward to new episodes, please take the time to leave us a five-star rating and review on whatever platform you use to listen. You can follow us on social media, on TikTok and Twitter. We are at True Crime Twins. On Instagram, we are at True Crime Twins Podcast. You can also email with questions, comments, case suggestions at truecrimetwinspodcast at gmail.com.